Thank you very, very much. Um, I really would like to thank uh, the members of the Anthromop team, Annalisa, Fabiola, and Sylvia for inviting me and for organizing uh, organizing this, uh, this talk. And, and of course, for all the members of the audience for uh, joining us. So there's some familiar names um, appearing at least on the first screen for me. And um, I'd also like to note a couple of things. One is that all of the names of the participants in my in the projects that I refer to in my talk are pseudonyms. Of course, they're not they're not their actual uh, names. And uh, I'm not going to be using PowerPoint, so I hope uh, I hope that'll be uh, that'll be okay. I'll just be um, uh, talking. So, uh, without further ado, let me let me get on to the paper. Um, I want to start the the paper with a. Um, quote from one of my interlocutors who was trying to explain why um, assignments or contracts um, outside of her home base of three to six months were her least favorite uh, time uh, duration. Three to six months, she said, is a killer, a killer. You don't have enough time to really build your life. It takes three to six months to start feeling comfortable. I'm not talking about going there and traveling. I'm talking about living and starting to go to the next step of, okay, now that I'm organized, can I look around? Can I try something new, a new activity? So by the time you start to get to that point, you go back. But here, here being in Canada, of course, people, you're leaving them behind. They miss you at the beginning and you leave a hole and they refill the hole with other stuff. So they don't have your place anymore, close quote. In the early 2000s, when I met her, Christine had worked for over 12 years as an international engineering consultant specializing in hydroelectric development. She had operated as an independent consultant, as well as an em employee for several large multinational engineering firms. Her work involved advising and or managing projects in a variety of locales outside her home base in Canada, and her visits to these sites had ranged from a week to an 18 month stay. In providing an account of the temporal range of her international assignments, Christine was careful to distinguish between the circumstances of consultants traveling to, as opposed to those living in these locales, even if temporarily. She contended that professionals taking long-term assignments abroad had to learn about and rebuild their lives around the different environments, culture, values, and lifestyles of the temp their temporary locale. While short-term consultants relied on the so-called local knowledge of those living there longer. But she also noted that quite often, quote, you have people coming short-term who have also done a lot of long-term things, close quote. Previous experience of more extended stays that allow them to get up to speed on their shorter visits much more quickly. Christine noted, they know what questions to ask. But a number of Christine's international projects had actually involved just a few months, as she notes, marking out an in-between experience, not long enough, not short enough, that in her view had not allowed her to adjust properly and get to know her new home, while at the same time still being just long enough to significantly disrupt her personal relationships in her home base in Canada. Hence her conclusion in the opening quote, the project assignments of three to six months were the killers. In this essay, I'm going to be using the term mobile life careers in reference to work lives, such as that described by Christine, which incorporate mobilities as ongoing constitutive features. But the invocation of this term is not intended to mark out a classificatory distinction between mobile and sedentary careers. Rather, the term is intended to highlight the entanglements arising through the dynamic interaction between mobilities, the life course and work. At issue is not simply whether a particular livelihood entails more or less mobility, but the ways in which the forms and pacing of mobilities may change over time, both as an intrinsic part of work routines, as well as of other domains influencing affected by or associated with these occupational practices. In other words, what is at issue in these entanglements may be a question less of scale than of timing as mobilities play out over an extended period of a person's career. Hence, I think the utility of a term such as life career. Um, as was already mentioned in the introduction to uh, this talk in considering 
these two types of conjunctures, I'm gonna be drawing on two of my own studies of mobile workers. The first is a study that was conducted during the early 2000s uh, among internationally mobile professionals, including Christine, who advised or managed projects involving various aspects of infrastructure development, largely in the global south. And this could range from hydroelectric power, which Quebec is particularly noted for, environmental communications planning, and much more. Largely based in Canada, their work required frequent travel to, and in some cases, extended stays in various international locales. The second study, which is still in progress, involves a follow-up to this earlier research that pays particular attention to changing patterns of work mobility. So it's involved interviews with some of the professionals who participated in this earlier project, and it's been very, very interesting to see what happened to them uh, in between um, in between projects situated as such a gap in, in years, but it's also involved snowballing to a larger range of mobile workers. Uh, while the other participants in these projects didn't necessarily share Christine's views considering the particular pitfalls of three to six months work sojourns, many did share her apprehension about their ability to reconcile the timing and duration of their business trips with both their personal commitments at any given moment as well as with the changing nature of these commitments and their work obligations over time. Central therefore to the relationship between these projects is the consideration of the factors that may prompt shifts in the pace of work mobility and the social implications and ramifications of these transitions in people's lives. Let me start off though uh, with a little bit of background in some of the research uh, and literature that's already been published on uh, particularly uh, on issues of family and life course in mobile work. As Karen Alwig and I noted in an introduction to a special journal issue that focused on continuities and disjunctures of movement, quote, positing a relationship between age or life phase and mobility has long been a feature of studies of movement, close quote. This connection has been of particular note in the frequent observation that migration favors the recruitment of the young. Philip Martin has thus argued that, quote, migration is not random. Young people are most likely to move over borders because they have the least invested in jobs and careers at home and the most time to recoup their investments in migration abroad, close quote. Martin's concern is with international labor migration. One of the principal benefits, however, of the development of mobility studies and of a network like Anthromob is a conceptual framework, is the scope that I think it's providing for an interrogation of a much wider spectrum of mobilities and immobilities. And a corollary of this expanded scope, it's, it's the possibility provides for a more expansive exploration of the interaction between the life course and mobilities. It allows us to view over the course of a person's life how different types of moves may be taken up with one form of move, mobility move following or being prompted and or enabled by another. In turn, paying attention to the interrelation between mobilities over individuals' lives can yield more general insights into the relationship between different forms of mobilities. So the concept of lifestyle migration drew from Alan Williams and Michael Hall's observations of the effects of cross influences between tourism and migration and people's particular experiences of mobility. A person might choose to relocate either seasonally or permanently to a place they had first gotten to know and like an earlier brief holiday visits. In a more recent discussion, Shanti Robertson has argued that, quote, it is the temporal dimension rather than the spatial that distinguishes migration from other forms of cross-border mobility, such as tourism, close quote. The time, Robertson notes, exercises influence, not just in the duration of a particular form of movement, but in the way in which it shapes the biography of the mover. If lifestyle migration has often involved people relocating as retirees, Robertson's research deals with the convergence between tourism, educational mobility, and migration that occurs at a much earlier phase of the life course. Her study of temporary graduate workers, and working holiday maker programs in Australia outlines the way in which a stay initiated on the basis of a particular time horizon can segue into a different type of move as some young sojourners eventually seek extended or even permanent residence. 
In short, the form and ramifications of a move may change over different phases of a person's life. But those transitions may also be contributing to and or drawing on the emergence of new genres of mobility. But mobilities of divergent temporalities can also emerge within the same broad domain. Christine's reflections with which I opened this essay illustrate how a person pursuing an ongoing career may at different times engage in work mobilities of varying durations and timings. While these different temporalities can have significantly different and important implications for personal relationships, as well as for a sense of emplacement and connection, they effectively constitute various types of assignments and phases in a continuing mobile career. As Christine also noted, different types of moves are often mutually referential precisely because they can occur over the course of the same person's life career rather than denoting sharply distinct circuits of travel. That is to say the experience of mobility in different temporal registers not only shapes a person's biography, it may also shape their response to and understanding of further mobilities and of the domains in which they occur. The complexity of these intersections between phases of a person's life and career, between different domains of mobility, between variable forms of mobility within the same domain can, however, make it difficult to distinguish between biographical and structural transitions. So working with the definition of mobile work as constituting, quote, activities in which 20% of the working time is spent away from the workplace and from home, and in which business trips play an important role, close quote, Sven Kesserling has argued that mobile work is becoming relevant to an increasing number of occupations. Louise Ryan and Ron Mulholland, however, caution against assuming a congruence between career and geographical mobility. In their study of French migrants working in London's financial and business sector, Ryan and Mulholland noted that while profession, mobile professionals may start off with a short-term sojourn in mind, plans can be altered bit by bit. The choice of staying or moving, they suggested, is not an either or between discrete possibilities, rather it reflects a gradual process of emplacement as career opportunities are combined with cumulative personal and familiar factors. They conclude therefore that what has been identified as a new type of super mover skilled migrant might actually reflect a particular life stage quote associated with a young and footloose close quote. In this essay, I'm going to argue that the circumstances of settlement and emplacement that Ryan and Mulholland have described for professional migrants in London and Shanti Robertson for students and working holidaymakers in Australia identify one form of accommodation between mobility, work, and life course transitions. It's one that while not involving the kind of largely unskilled labor migration that Philip Martin was describing, still agrees with his larger point. It's the young who are likely to move, and when they settle and take on commitments, they are less likely to move again. In these cases, a delimited life course phase remains tightly articulated with work mobility. This is therefore not so much a description of a mobile life career as of a career catalyzed by a decisive move associated with a particular life phase. This is certainly a familiar arrangement, but it's not an inevitable response to the strains that can form between work mobilities on the one hand and personal attachments and commitments that are accumulating over time on the other hand. Another possible response involves organizing one's work life to enable a schedule of mobilities that can be, hopefully, more or less reconciled with these bonds, even when these are embedded in a particular locale. Most of the mobile pro professionals who participate in the two studies with which I'm concerned in this essay endeavored to make these kinds of logistical arrangements over the duration of their careers. But the arrangements they organized shifted over different phases of their lives and work. Their capacity to negotiate the varying accommodations that could help them to balance work mobilities and personal commitments more often benefited from experience than youth. These were mobile life careers that often tended to favor proven track records and seniority rather than youthful footlessness. Nor I think are these kinds of strategies unique to the occupational field with which I'm concerned. Uh, Ryan and Mulholland's study is part of an emerging body of research 
that seeks to draw attention to the important role of family commitments and personal networks in the fashioning of mobile careers, often with an emphasis on the critical role of the temporal in these uh, processes. And as I'll try to illustrate in the remainder of this paper, the wide range of strategies employed by my interlocutors and or reported in comparative studies include, but also certainly extend beyond the notion that mobile work is a feature of only one phase of the life course. So in what follows, I wanna describe several um, strategies that my interlocutors use to, to try and reconcile um, their domestic and personal commitments with um, their traveling lives uh, as uh, mobile professionals. The first of these, um, which recurred in, in quite a few uh, um, of the biographies of my interlocutors, was um, relying on frequent but short and intense uh, work trips. Um, now, most of the participants um, in the two related studies that I'm going to be drawing on uh, were quite eager to be involved in international uh, development projects, but found that getting a foothold in this field initially was neither easy nor immediate. Sending specialists to work on projects far from their home bases is an expensive undertaking. So employers, associates, clients, and donor agencies and executing agencies are often wary of involving someone without a proven track record of mobile work. I'm gonna turn now to focus on several uh, people who participated in both uh, projects, even though the two projects include um, others who um, didn't participate in both. Professionals like my, my interlocutors, uh, Michael or James, uh, who participate in both projects found that they needed to build up a resume of pertinent international experience before they were likely to be offered these types of opportunities. After several years of public service employment in Canada, uh, Michael, a specialist in resource and environmental management, spent two years working in West Africa as a volunteer for a Canadian charity focusing on international assistance. At least part of his motivation for taking on this mission was the hope that it might eventually enhance his prospects for an internationally mobile career. When Michael returned to Canada, he indeed succeeded in securing employment with a large engineering, construction, and environmental management company that supported both domestic and international projects. But it still took him several years more before he was eventually assigned to international projects. But, quote, once I established a reputation with certain key managers that do a lot of international work, I guess my currency as a consultant within the company was established and I was in demand for working overseas. Close quote. Like Michael, James's career had been shaped in important ways by his desire to ensure a measure of international work mobility. After graduating with a BA, James took a break and spent a year traveling around Central and South America. That experience led him to pursue further studies and those studies uh, resulted in a degree that he was able to parlay into successive jobs involving international education programs, work that involved frequent travel to and sojourns in different Latin American countries, as well as to various destinations in Canada. James subsequently moved from Ontario to Quebec to take a position in a small independent consulting firm that provided evaluation studies for international development agencies. This firm, however, increasingly became involved in active project management, which became the full-time focus of James's work, even though that meant working in a different world region than he had been working in up to that point. While early in their, their careers, Michael and James had devoted some effort to actively seek out opportunities for internationally mobile work, both were nonetheless concerned to mitigate the impact of their travels on their families, especially while their children were young. They did so by trying to ensure that each of their trips away from home were kept to two or three weeks, even though cumulatively they were likely to be absent for three to four months in any given year. Michael noted that this pattern of travel had in fact been a commitment that he had made to his wife, quote, so that the absence from the family, which eventually grew to include two daughters, is not extended, close quote. James noted that, quote, for years, I've refused to take assignments, which would make me be overseas for more than a month, close quote. As I've noted elsewhere, this strategy of multiple short work trips recurred amongst a number of my interlocutors while raising their children. It's also echoed 
in Karen Fast and Johan Lindell's study of Swedish corporate business elites whose work involved frequent travel. Fast and Lindell note that in their efforts to balance work time and family time, these professionals tried to restrict the extent of their trips away from home to periods ranging from a couple of days to a couple of weeks. And they tried to make the most of their time away by adopting strenuous work schedules when traveling, an intensity that has characterized most of the short-term project trips undertaken by participants in my own research as well. But arranging these kinds of schedules of multiple intense but relatively short trips is not always easily accomplished. The ability of both Michael and James to insist on travel schedules that were more amenable to their family obligations was significantly enabled by their increasing seniority. While Michael started off as a project coordinator, he was eventually promoted to a management position within a regional office of his company. James acquired a partnership in the Quebec firm, which gave him a good deal of leeway. Both James and Michael noted that their ability to insist on shorter trips away was not necessarily enjoyed by other professionals who were engaged in mobile work. James observed that, quote, I do have that luxury to get those kinds of jobs that have shorter trips. I know many people have to do that, referring to travel of longer duration. And I think it's really tough, close quote. Similarly, in 2002, Michael had described the situation of some of the associates in his company as involving assignments of, quote, six to eight months overseas. And they have families with young kids, and they're in a difficult situation because they don't want to do that much. But they get paid a good salary, they haven't got a domestic practice around them, and they haven't got staff that they leave behind to keep things go moving along in their absence, close quote. Michael had been determined to avoid that very situation. And he did this in part by insisting on maintaining an involvement in domestic as well as international projects. But there had been a cost to that dual involvement, quote, I've probably sacrificed some of my career by choosing to be hardline and balanced between domestic and international work, close quote. The advantage of keeping a foot in both types of practices, however, was the leverage he felt it had given him to resist pressure from some colleagues that, quote, would have me overseas every waking moment and then some, close quote. Let me turn now to another strategy that's, that I found and that's also been reported in some of the literature and that is taking up particular openings in the life course, the opportunity that those openings afford to get engaged in, um, uh, in, in mobile work. And here I'll turn to one of my interlocutors who I'm calling uh, Tanya. Now, Tanya thought it would be extremely difficult to do what Michael was doing and to sustain concurrent involvement in domestic and international practices, even within the same organization. She explained that, quote, most people who do international work end up doing very little but international work. International schedules, they move all the time. They change nothing as ever as it's originally planned to be in terms of a timetable. And so if you've made a commitment to a domestic project, then you can find yourself in a difficult position, close quote. By 2000, Tanya, consultant with training in urban and environmental management, had been working for large engineering firms, as Christine had, for 11 years, with a dossier entirely focused on international projects. Unlike both Michael and James, Tanya expressed a decided preference for assignments that allowed her to spend longer on site. But, as she herself observed, by the time Tanya had embarked on this kind of mobile work, she'd had a, a, a long career doing other things before then, she had few of the domestic obligations that led James and Michael to insist on relatively short trips abroad. Quote, I don't have the same stresses that I've seen in some of my colleagues because I don't have a spouse and my son, who was by then an independent adult, doesn't depend on me being there, close quote. She noted that while she had colleagues with young families who carried out a lot of travel for work, quote, more than I would have imagined, close quote. Most in this situation didn't want to. Tanya, on the other hand, found herself getting antsy after even a few months without travel abroad, but she'd been able to act on that love of mobility at a particular opening in her life. Similarly, in their review of the mobility strategies employed by peripatetic Swedish medical professionals, Katarzyna Bostrom and her uh, co-authors describe efforts to minimize the effects of family separation, in which the timing of travel focused on particular openings in the life course. These could include periods between relationships, setting up before having children, 
or after the children have grown up. The notion of life course transition serving as openings for a new pacing of mobilities appeared recurrently in the life careers on which I'm focusing in this essay. When I first spoke to Michael in 2002, he was adamant that he had no intention of ever relocating his home base from the Western uh, Canadian city in which he was living at the time of our talk. But when I spoke again to Michael in 2019, he was now living thousands of miles away from Canada and had been doing so for nearly six years. The opportunity to relocate had occurred after an extended period in which Michael had been seconded by his company to work on two major domestic projects situated in his Canadian home base. Michael had enjoyed his participating in these domestic projects, but he had missed being involved in international work. So when the projects were successfully completed, he was glad of his company's offer to undertake a post abroad as the regional director of a new environmental division. Michael was able to take on this new post with its attendant residential relocation because his wife who accompanied him on this move was able to secure a job in this locale that was commensurate with her skills. And their daughters were by then adults who could choose whether to join their parents to pursue post-secondary studies in this new location or whether they would just stay on in Canada. The question of whether or not this move would become a permanent relocation or just a long-term overseas assignment was left open for a later decision. Similarly, James's choice of jobs and the tempo of his work mobility reflected to an important degree an effort to shift to meet the shifting schedule needs of his family at different phases. When his children were still very young for a time, both James and his wife were engaged in careers that involved extensive travel. The considerable challenges of scheduling posed by this dual mobility, James explained, was not just a matter of ensuring synchronization between the demands of their respective work travels in any one period, but of synchronizing the stages of their career. Quote, so one time when she, he's referring to his wife, had a big new job that meant that she was traveling, I purposely took a secondment to a college, which I knew would be less travel, less hours than the job I had as a way of being the guy at home more. I had regular hours so she could do her traveling and build her career for a couple of years. Then when I had the chance to move to Quebec and join a small independent consulting firm, whose name I won't mention here, she made somewhat of a sacrifice to leave. But by then she knew she could get a reasonable job here, i.e. in Quebec. So you kind of try and plan your careers and balance that burden. But yeah, it's stressful, I think, and a challenge. And many Canadian professionals are increasingly required to work overseas, close quote. By 2004, with his children grown and away at school, James had more free time and he was looking forward to the possibility of using this opening to work overseas more often again. Quote, that's where the work is, the most fascinating part of it. So it's fun to go, close quote. Of relevance here, I think, is an observation by Alan Findlay and several co-authors in a recent publication that an analysis of migration decisions inevitably involves a consideration of linked lives. As members of households with multiple earners and complex labor market links engage in layered negotiations about possible relocations. Findlay et al. further note that migration decisions are not just a matter of timing in relation to life course transitions, but also sequencing. They argue that, quote, a change in sequencing, sequencing fundamentally affects the meaning of a particular migration move, close quote. While Findlay and his co-authors were concerned with migration, the entanglements described by my interlocutors suggest that similar temporal considerations also apply to a much broader spectrum of work mobilities, from brief trips to short stays to residential relocations of various durations. After all, the interaction between the timing, duration, and sequencing of work mobilities doesn't occur at just one point in a person's life. Instead, for mobile workers such as Michael, James, Christine, or Tanya, it can be refashioned repeatedly over their life careers. Tanya's career eventually involved an even greater number of repeated relocations and a variety of employment circumstances, including long periods of work as a salaried employee for large engineering firms, as I've already mentioned, then extended contracts as a specialist in projects sponsored respectively by a multilateral commission and an aid agency, as well as years of freelancing. 
These different forms of employment involved residential relocations between different regions in Canada, as well as between Canada and Southeast Asia. So for a time, Tanya maintained a base in a Southeast Asian city from which she traveled frequently to work as a freelancer on projects dispersed over various locales in the global South, as well as on occasional trips back to North America to visit family and friends. She eventually returned to Canada to take up the offer of a salaried position as the manager of an international division for a large engineering firm. But she discovered that as a manager, the role left less time for work trips abroad than she had expected. So after a couple of years, she shifted employment again and embarked on a new year, new five-year project contract. And that commitment brought her back again to the same Southeast Asian urban base where she had lived earlier. Years later, as the term of that contract was due to expire, Tanya was beginning to think about planning for a new life course opening, a gradual retirement. Much as she had appreciated living in Southeast Asia, she knew that she didn't want to retire in this region, not least because she wanted to be nearer to her son. She wanted to reestablish a home in North America and continue working and traveling, but if possible, at a reduced pace. Tanya, who was American born, elected to resettle in a city on the west coast of the United States, a city that she had never lived in before. Her decision to move there reflected a careful analysis of a variety of factors that I won't get into here, but they most especially included reasonable proximity to her son who had earlier settled elsewhere on the west coast, but not too far away. By 2020, Tanya was enjoying her new home and garden, a developing network of local friendships and acquaintances, as well as visits with her son. And before the pandemic hit, she was also still traveling professionally to a variety of destinations, now again as a freelancer. But by this point, the nature of her role as an internationally mobile specialist was changing in some important ways. By now, her contributions often involved her in the role of an expert, evaluator, or advisor, rather than as a project head or team member. In this role, her work usually involved a combination of relatively short trips abroad and further analysis that was carried out at home. So let me now look, look at the final strategy that I want to look at uh, in this, in this um, talk, and that is the way in which my interlocutors responded to the restructuring of the employment fields in which they were um, uh, occupied. Um, in addition to key transitions in Tanya's own life and career, including gearing down for an eventual retirement, the adjustment of her role in development projects also seemed to reflect broader structural shifts in the organization of these types of endeavors. Several of my recent interlocutors who had worked in related fields have contended that international development projects, whatever their source of funding, were increasingly likely to rely on the recruitment of quite a few of the professional staff locally rather than importing them from Western countries such as Canada. In a 2019 interview, Sydney, a senior engineer whose career had prominently featured projects outside Canada and a variety of work mobilities of different frequency and duration argued that while Canadians were well known uh, internationally for the quality of their expertise in hydroelectric development, the terms of their mobility uh, uh, in international projects were changing. Um, it's less about, he said, less about sending somebody from Canada to Africa and more about building it in, in Africa. When I, uh, when, he's, when I went to India, where he early in his career had worked on site for three years, I went with 30 people from Canada. So that's not gonna happen. That kind of thing I think is over. I think the experts will still come from wherever the best place to get that expertise is. So that'll still happen, close quote. But it won't happen, he contended, as part of these large project teams um, going off uh, to run a project elsewhere. Similarly, James argued that the opportunities for young Canadians seeking to develop an international career in development work were now much reduced by comparison to his own entry into the sector decades ago. Donor agencies such as the World Bank increasingly gave the money directly to the executing agencies in the country in which the project was being developed rather than to consulting companies in countries such as Canada. Um, since over the years there had been significant emphasis by these donor agencies on a transfer of knowledge, there was now, he argued, less need 
for, for Canadian consultants or even for NGO work. Nonetheless, James contended there seemed to be definitely still a role for Western experts in the field of evaluation and monitoring, which according to him was huge. Senior consultants like Tanya, who have built long resumes attesting to their work in various capacities and diverse projects in many locales, regions, and with different types of organizations, are more likely to have had the time to build an extensive international network of contacts and a reputation for valued expertise in certain specialization. In short, since more people are likely to have worked with Tanya or to have heard of her work, it's not surprising to find her name coming up in searches for specialists to serve on international evaluation panels. So here we have a transnational occupational sector that has been built on an expectation of work mobility that in practice often privileges senior or at least more experiences, more experienced practitioners. The preference for experienced consultants in international development work is not, however, uh, particularly new. As I noted, it, it took Michael and James years before, um, before they uh, could build resumes that will allow them to be considered for international assignments. But this preference for seasoned experts may have become even further entrenched more recently, at least for professionals based in Western countries who are interested in pursuing opportunities to work internationally. It may not be especially easy for younger professionals to reconcile the demands of work mobility with family responsibilities, but neither is it that easy for them to enter this domain altogether. The changing but continuing role of Tanya as a consultant also throws a broader spotlight on the ways in which other kinds of structural shifts in related fields occurring at different levels entangle with the pace and form of work mobilities as well as personal networks and attachments. Not long after Michael and his family moved away from Canada, there was a global slump in the resource market in which the development of the new regional group he was heading was premised. His company conse consequently decided to disband this division and return its employees to their original offices in various locales in the world. Michael and his family were, however, reluctant to return to Canada only a couple of years after they ex had experienced the major upheaval of a residential relocation. They enjoyed their new lifestyles. His wife had a very good post she didn't want to leave. To quote Michael, she'd followed me all over the place. It was my turn to stay and support her, close quote. And one of his daughters was enrolled in a program in a nearby university. So Michael took retirement from his company. He and his family stayed put. And for the next three years, he worked as an independent mobile consultant, traveling to various destinations in Asia and Pacific. In addition, each summer, he and his wife made an extended return visit to Canada for five to six weeks. But the work visas on which Michael and his wife had depended were due to expire in the summer of 2019 and the family was planning on returning to Canada. Since Michael had made a point of staying in touch with former clients and, and associates, when he made it known that he'd be coming back, he received a number of job offers, one of which he accepted. While Michael, now in his mid sixties, planned to continue working and traveling for some ongoing projects. He didn't want it to be at the same frenetic pace, to quote him. A similar kind of structural shift in the nature of the work available in a particular region occurred in James's life career. When I spoke to James in 2019, he revealed that in 2007, 2008, he had sold his partnership and resigned from the consulting firm that originally occasioned his move to the province of Quebec. His departure reflected a waning of the international work available to him through this firm that had been propped not by the firm, but by a shift in Canadian government policy, which cut funding for the region on which James's project work in this consultancy had come to focus. Almost immediately after his resignation, he received an offer from another firm to work as the manager of a new Southeast Asian project. His new firm was, however, located in Ontario rather than Quebec. This time, however, James didn't move his home or his family, choosing instead to commute weekly between his work base and his home in Quebec, in addition to traveling outside of Canada for multiple short trips over the course of the year. After three years of doing this, James had had enough of this demanding pattern of dual mobilities, and he decided to set out on his own as a freelancer. Both Michael and James had to respond to the unexpected impact of broad restructurings of the fields in which they were working. 
But in responding to these macro shifts, Michael and James had to bear in mind the implications of these transitions for their work plans, but also for their most intimate relationships and domestic arrangements. The ensuing occupational choices of both men incorporated an, an insistence on respecting the preferences and circumstances of family members who had supported them on previous schedules of mobilities and quote, follow them all over the place, to paraphrase Michael. But Michael and James's abilities to make the kind of accommodations that would allow them to reconcile work family mobility were, and repeatedly were significantly enabled by their extended resumes. These reputations led to job offers when they needed them. Like Tanya, this previous experience also allowed both men to take up the option of working independently as freelancers at key points in their careers. Roland, another interlocutor who had embarked on freelance work relatively late in his career, noted that his ability to do so effectively relied heavily on the professional reputation and large network of contacts that he had built up over years of working as a salaried consultant. It would be much harder to go out on your own, Roland conjectured, at a junior stage of your career. So a few concluding remarks, and thank you for bearing with me. Our changes in the pace of intensity of work mobilities, largely being prompted by systemic shifts in the organization of certain occupational sectors, as Kesserling suggested, or are they more likely to reflect personal life course shifts, as Ryan and Mulholland have suggested? The life careers that I've presented in this essay suggest that both processes can certainly be in play. On the one hand, Michael, James, and Tanya all observed the many of their younger colleagues who are in the process of raising families prefer to restrict their work tra uh, travel in order to limit separations from their family, even if it wasn't always possible for them to effectively negotiate this preference with their employer. And when it wasn't possible for some to negotiate this kind of preference, they left that, uh, that kind of employment. The desire to avoid long separations was a driving force behind the ways in which Michael and James organize their own work travels over major phases of their careers and lives. And if, as Ryan and Mulholland noted, emplacement after a job move may be gradual and cumulative in its effect over time, so too can the impact an organization of mobility. The nature, pace, and intensity of mobility may shift over the course of a person's life career as their circumstances, relationships, and networks change. What I think is particularly striking about the job histories of my interlocutors is the diversity of mobilities with which they engaged over the course of their careers. As Bostrom et al. noted in their study of Swedish medical professionals and Bridget Suter observed in her study of intra-corporate transfers from Europe to China, openings in the life course may be associated with the timing of particular forms of work mobilities. It's noteworthy that Tanya embarked on a highly mobile career when her son was grown up and that she subsequently made a major residential move at a later stage of her career uh, that enabled her to be closer to him. When James's children had grown up, he considered ramping up the pace of his international travel again. And Michael undertook first one and then another major residential relocation. But the accounts of these interlocutors also underscore uh, the impact as I've described of larger uh, in smaller structural shifts in their occupational sectors. The changes in these occupational sectors didn't in and of themselves precisely determine what kind of mobilities these professionals undertook. Each of these individuals made a set of personal choices. They expressed and exercised some measure of discretion, even if somewhat constrained, over how they would respond to these structural developments choices that reflected appraisals of their respective domestic and personal commitments, as well as career options in particular periods of their lives. It was in short the dynamic interplay between these structural developments, life course phases and personal commitments that shaped the fluctuation of work mobilities among these consultants. To a certain extent, this interplay turns the presumption of youth that usually presides in calculations of mobility such as migration on its head. The career histories recounted by the participants in my own study, or these two studies, seem to suggest a trajectory of mobility that almost inverts this demographic arc. It was not especially easy for young and still relatively inexperienced professionals to enter this domain of international work assignments. For those who did manage to gain a foothold, it could be difficult to negotiate the pacing of their work trips. It was often more feasible 
for senior professionals to say no to assignments that would entail long separations from their family. And the range of mobility options available to these professionals increased with their age before retirement. In part, this is because certain openings in their personal lives provided them with more flexibility in terms of work mobility. But in part, I think this is because the corporations and agencies recruiting them often prefer to work with consultants who could boast a substantial record. In this type of career trajectory, it might therefore not be so much the young and footloose as the senior and well-established who are able to sustain work mobility over time. And I'll stop there. Thank you for your patience. <laughs>